if you would open with me in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 23. Genesis 23 is where we're going to be at this morning. We are in the book of Genesis, the book of beginnings, and also um, some other passages that we're going to turn to that I don't have on the screen. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn to them already. Hebrews chapter 11 and 1 Corinthians 15. Now, how many of you were here last week? Last week. Okay. Last week, before I get to the message today, I, I, have, to, I have to apologize. I have to rectify something. I made a mistake last week. How many of you remember the story I told about my little son, Asher, running into the street? You remember that story? I left out a critical detail of that story that I meant to tell, but I forgot. And as soon as I dismissed the service, I remembered I had forgotten a very, very important detail. And I was absolutely mortified that I forgot to share it with you. Now, I had told you the story how Asher had run towards the street and had run past Heather and how Heather didn't go after him. And I made Heather to look made her out to look like this horrible parent, which she is not. And the, the part of the story I left out was when I said something about, are you going to get Asher to Heather? What she heard me say was, I'm going to get Asher. And so because she heard me say, I'm going to get Asher, she didn't get him. So I just wanted to say my wife is a good mom. <laughs> she loves our children very much. Uh, I was very just, I felt so bad last week that I forgot to mention that, and I said, I am going to fix that this morning, first thing. Um, she wasn't in here. She was feeding the baby, and I was like, oh, good, she didn't hear it. But then I forgot that they have a TV in the baby room, and that's where she's at right now, feeding the baby, so I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I said, I said, did you hear this, the story I told about Asher? She says, yeah. I said, did you notice the, that I left out that you thought I said I was going to get Asher? She said, yeah. I said, I'm sorry. She said, yeah. No, she didn't. No, she didn't. She said she forgave me and we made up, and uh, we're still married today, thank God. <laughs> now, we'll see after the end of today, you know, what I have to apologize for next week. Okay, um, the last two weeks we've been in Genesis after our break uh, have been incredible weeks. We've seen God just do some amazing things. The first week back in Genesis, we saw that the promise God made to Abraham that he was going to have an offspring, an heir, that God made good on his promise, Right? Isaac was born, Isaac whose name means laughter, and so joy came into this household of a 100-year-old man and 90-year-old woman as they gave birth to the son of promise, and we learned that God always keeps his word, amen. amen. God always keeps his word, and he proved it to Abraham, he's proved it to every saint throughout history, he's proving it in my life, I believe he's proven it in your life, amen. God always keeps his word. And then we saw that last week, Abraham's faith was tested, wasn't it? The greatest test that Abraham ever had to endure as God uh, asked a Abraham to offer up his son Isaac to him. It was a test of his faith. And Abraham, he passed the test, right? And in that, we saw a beautiful picture of Christ. We learned that all of the scripture is about Jesus and that it points to Jesus Christ. Now... Today uh, marks our 13th week, 13 weeks we've spent studying the life of Abraham, learning about his journey and God calling him and working through his life and working through him and his wife Sarah and their faith together. Spent about 13 weeks and um, Isaiah 51, 1 and 2, it actually tells us, the Bible tells us to study the life of Sarah and Abraham. I want to share this verse with you today. Isaiah 51, verse 1 and 2. It says, listen to me, you who pursue righteousness. How many of you are pursuing righteousness today, okay? This word is for you from the Lord. Listen to me, you who seek the Lord. How many of you are here? You're here today because you're seeking the Lord. I believe that's why you're here today. I don't believe you came just to 
hang out, just to meet some friends and see some people. I believe you're here today because you're pursuing righteousness and you're seeking the Lord. Now, this is the instruction the Lord gives to those people. He says, look to the rock from which you were hewn and the quarry from which you were dug. Look to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah, who bore you. For he was but one when I called him, that I might bless him and multiply him. And what the Lord is saying is that us, who are Christians today, through Jesus Christ, we are a part of Abraham and Sarah's family. We're part of Abraham and Sarah's family. We're part of the offspring that God promised to Abraham. God said, your descendants are going to be like the stars of the sky, the sand of the the seashore, innumerable. You're a part of that fulfillment of God's promise today. Did you know that? Turn to your neighbor and say, you're shining like the stars today. And turn to your another neighbor and say, you're you're all over me like sand. I don't know. Something like... (laughs) (laughs) we're a part of Abraham's family the word picture here that God uses through the prophet Isaiah is that Abraham and Sarah were like this huge quarry all of us have been cut from that rock you know you can you can uh study a, a rock I can't but some people can they can look at a rock and they can tell where it came from what quarry what type of dirt it was in and surrounded by today after church I'm going to take my son Judah uh, to um, a little outing a father we're gonna have some father-son time a little one-on-one time he calls it his daddy Judah date so I'm going to take him all out I took faith on a date last week so now I got to make it up and take it Take my son Judah, and I'm going to have to take Asher. And Anyway, um, I'm, I'm taking him to Six Flags. If he has to t- oh, my. <laughs> I didn't say Disney World <laughs> or the moon. I'm taking him to Six Flags. It's not like, uh, anyway. <laughs> Six Flags, as you know, maybe you don't know, it used to be a quarry. It was this mountain that was, was dug out. And the rocks are all over Texas and the United States and this quarry. And so these using this analogy of the Abraham and Sarah, they were like th- this great quarry and that we are like rocks cut out of that. We're a part of their family today. And our faith, there's so much of our faith that is wrapped up in the faith of Abraham and Sarah. And we've learned that over the last 13 weeks. There's much to be learned about our faith by studying their faith. Now, I say all that today because today is a sad passage. Genesis chapter uh, 23 is, is not one of those passages where you're just like throwing parties and, you know, have streamers and balloons. It's, it's a sad passage. And that's because today is the end of Abraham and Sarah. Today's the end of Abraham and Sarah because today we're going to learn about Sarah dying. I know. I know it's sad. Even though it was 4,000 years ago. Um, Today's the end of Abraham and Sarah. And from here on, Genesis will begin to focus and and it will shift to the life of the promised child. After today, we're going to spend some weeks learning about Isaac and his life and his walk with the Lord and his faith. And from there, we're going to learn about Jacob and how the generations uh, keep marching forward and how the blessing of God is passed down from generation to generation. Now, today is a little bit of an uncomfortable subject because we're looking at the subject of death. Nobody likes to think about death um, unless you're just, you need prayer, you know, um, you know, unless you're just a morbid individual. But anyway, Nobody, nobody no, no, no normal people just wake up in the morning and say, hey, I wonder what it's going to be like when I die. And I think today I'm going to plan my funeral, and maybe I'll drive to buy the funeral home and pick out a casket. And I mean, that's not what we're doing with our lives. Usually, we, we like to pretend and think about that, you know, we're going to live forever on this earth and that none of us are going to 
die. So death is a little bit of an uncomfortable subject. I'm, my hope today is that I instill some hope in you uh, from this passage and other passages of Scripture today so that we don't have to face death with fear, but that we can face death with the eternal hope that we have in Jesus Christ. I, um, on the list of fears that people have, do you know what people's number one fear is? It's actually public speaking. When, when people are, yeah, when people are polled, their number one fear that they say is public speaking. Their number two fear on the list, just, you know, not everybody, but just averaged out, number two on the list is dying. So people in, in order are number one, afraid of speaking in public, and number two, afraid of dying. So that means if you're attending a funeral, the majority of people would be, rather be the person in the box than the person standing on stage giving the eulogy, just <laughs> according to statistics. So it's just a little anecdote for you there today. Everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. That's the great uh, blues song by Albert King. And uh, today we're going to look at death. We're going to look at Sarah's death. And uh, I pray that we would all um, examine our own mortality today, all of us here today, that we would do that. We would examine where we are in our life. I don't know if you know this. It's just a little secret. I found out that like the mortality rate for human beings, it's hovering right around 100%. I don't know if you realize that. It's, it, the, the percentage of people who die, it's, it's really, really close to 100%. It's, it's like it could hardly be any closer to 100%. So all of us here today, unless the Lord returns, and I know we're all hoping that he, he returns today. I mean, he, the Lord could return today. Did you know that? Are you ready to meet the Lord if he returns today? I hope so. The Lord could return today. I could be down there at Six Flags riding on the Ferris wheel with my son Judah. I'd, I'd have a little bit of head start on all of you and the trumpet blasts and I'm, I'm caught up into the air with Judah off the Ferris wheel, right? I, he could come today. At any moment, the Lord could return. It could be another thousand years before the Lord returns. It could be another 10,000 years. I don't know. Nobody knows when the Lord's going to return. Nobody knows. The Bible doesn't tell us. Nobody knows. But if the Lord doesn't return in the next 100 years, all of us will face death. All of us in this room will walk through that doorway. So it's, it's appropriate for us to look at these things. Um, I love the Bible. It's the most honest book in the world. It's the most real book in the world. It doesn't try to hide anything from us. And so today it brings up this subject of death. And so we're going to look at it today as we're going through the book of Genesis. Today what I'm going to do is I'm going to read the entire passage for you. Then I'm going to pray and we're going to walk through uh, some stuff this morning. So Genesis chapter 23. Sarah lived 127 years. I said I was going to read the whole thing through, but I have to stop. Um, this is the only woman in the entire Bible whose age is mentioned. And I think it's because women have, do a really good job of keeping that secret and <laughs> undercover. Nevertheless... We learn here that Sarah was 127 years when she passed. That means that Isaac is about 37 years old now, okay? The son of promise, born to her when she was 90. So 127 years. These were the years of the life of Sarah. And Sarah died at Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And Abraham went in to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. And Abraham rose up from before his dead and said to the Hittites, I am a sojourner and a foreigner among you. 
Give me property among you for a burying place that I may bury my dead out of my sight. Abraham had been living in tents. He was a, like a nomad. He didn't have any land. He didn't own any land. God had called him out from his land to a foreign place and had made him a promise that one day his in, in, inheritance or his um, offspring would inherit this land. And so he doesn't have anywhere to bury his dear departed wife, Sarah. So he goes to the people of the land, the Hittites, and he asks for a place to bury his wife, Sarah, his princess. Sarah's name means princess. The Hittites answered Abraham, Hear us, my lord. You are a prince of God among us. Bury your dead in the choicest of our tombs. None of us will withhold from you his tomb to hinder you from burying your dead. Abraham rose and bowed to the Hittites, the people of the land. And he said to them, if you are willing that I should bury my dead out of my sight, hear me and entreat me for Ephron, the son of Zohar, that he may give me the cave of Machpelah, which he owns. It is in the end of his field. For the full price, let him give it to me in your presence as a property for a burying place. He says, they say, we'll give you a plot of land. We'll give you a place to bury your dead. And he says, I'm going to buy a place. I, I'm, I want to own this place. And he has a place picked out. It's called the Cave of Machpelah. Now Ephron was sitting among the Hittites, and Ephron the Hittite answered Abraham in the hearing of the Hittites, of all who went in and out of the gate of his city. The gate of the cities where the men of the city and the women of the city came to do business. No, my Lord, hear me. I give you the field. So here Ephron comes and says, I will give it to you. Now this is a um, sort of a song and dance. Um, he's really not giving it to him. It's just a courtesy for the way that they're doing negotiations. He says, I'll give you the field and the cave that is in it. Notice he adds the field. Abraham only wanted the cave. There's a reason why he adds the field to it. Number one, he knows that he's going to charge him for the land. And he knows if he attaches the field to the cave that he can charge more money for it. So he's, he's um, I was going to say he's like a used car salesman, but I don't, I don't really have anything against used car salesmen. I've bought, in fact, I've only ever owned used cars and they've all been great, but you know the type of person I'm talking about, right? The, this kind of wheeler dealer. Um, you go in to buy a shirt and you leave without a shirt. Like, you know, they rob the shirt off your back kind of thing. That's what this guy's doing. He's, he's negotiating really hard. And if you're here today and you sell used cars, God bless you. I pray you break all the sales records this week in Jesus' name. He says, I'll give you this field and the cave that is in it in the side of the sons of my people. I give it to you. Bury your dead. Then Abraham bowed down before the people of the land, and he said to Ephron in the hearing of the people of the land, but if you will hear me, I give the price of the field, accept it from me that I may bury my dead there. Ephron answered Abraham, my Lord, Listen to me, a piece of land worth 400 shekels of silver, what is it between me and you? Bury your dead. Notice how he slips in the price that he wants there, right? I'll give it to you, it's free. Don't worry about it. Abraham says, no, I want to pay for it. Hey, what, what difference is it you between me and you, my friend? What difference is 400 shekels of silver between me and you, right? Have you ever, you know... Um, had someone give, quote unquote, give something to you, and then they keep mentioning to you how much it cost and how expensive it was, and you know, exactly to like the penny. What difference does it make? It was only $47.35. No big deal. What is that between me and you? And you're like, fine, I'll pay you back, all right? That's what's going on here. But he lists an incredibly high price probably double what it's worth, expecting Abraham to negotiate with him because that's what this whole song and dance is about. What is 400 shekels of silver between me and, me and you? That's about seven and a half pounds of silver. All right? 
Seven and a half pounds. Abraham listened to Ephron, and Abraham weighed out for Ephron the silver that he had named in the hearing of the Hittites, 400 shekels of silver according to the weights current among the merchants. Abraham said, that's what you want. That's what I'll give you. I'm not going to negotiate. I'm not going to go through this whole thing. That's the price. Here you go. So the field of Ephron in Machpelah, which was to the east of Mamre, the field with the cave that was in it and all the trees that were in the field throughout its whole area was made over to Abraham as a possession in the presence of the Hittites before all who were at the gate of his city. After this, Abraham buried Sarah, his wife, in the cave of Machpelah, east of Mamre, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. The field and the cave that is in it were made over to Abraham as a property for a burying place by the Hittites. Father, thank you for your word today. I pray that you would speak to our hearts through it. Uh, Lord, help us to see uh, the truth that is in here today. And help us to not just be hearers of your word, but to be doers of it. We give you the glory and the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, Abraham and Sarah, as we've been studying them, um, it's most likely that they have been married together for over a century. Can you imagine celebrating your 100th wedding anniversary? I think brother and sister Beatles are on their 73rd wedding anniversary. Is that right? Do I have that right? 73 years. They're getting close. But they still got like 28 years or 27 years. I mean, like, how many of you have been married less than 27 years? Like, your whole marriage plus their marriage doesn't even come close to Abraham and Sarah. Can you imagine being married to someone for a hundred years? Some of you are like, nope, I cannot imagine that. Some of you are like, I can't imagine being married after lunch today. I just, I didn't know if we were going to make it to church today. But we're here, praise the Lord, by the grace of God. Married for a hundred years. Now, had Abraham and Sarah's marriage been a perfect marriage? No. It had been a far from perfect marriage. We're talking about two fallen, broken individuals. And how many of you know when two fallen, broken individuals get together, it doesn't produce heaven on earth? (laughs) That, That in any marriage, like every single one of our marriages... The husband will sin against the wife. The wife will sin against the husband. Because we are redeemed saints, but we still have a sin nature. And so Abraham and Sarah, they had sinned against each other, just like any of us who have been married for longer than an hour have probably sinned (laughs) against your husband or your wife. And they have not sinned against each other in a small way. Not like leaving some little detail of a story out of a sermon. We're talking a major way that they had sinned against each other. Remember, Abraham twice, twice had given Sarah as a wife to another man. That's kind of big time on the charts of like sinning against your wife. That goes like right up, you know, towards the top. Not doing it once, but twice. Twice. Because he was a coward, and he was afraid of these powerful men. He comes up with this scheme and says, pretend to be my sister. I can't even imagine. Twice he does it. And Sarah, she's no, you know, innocent little dove. Thank you. <laughs> she's, she concocted this scheme to bring another woman into their marriage. Here, uh, Abraham, get this other lady pregnant. That's the idea I've come up with. What? What? So they have both sinned against each other in very large ways. 
not in small ways. Their marriage has been through some tough times as Sarah had to watch Abraham and his other wife raise that kid, living through the domestic abuse that that other child was heaping upon the son of promise, Isaac. Their marriage had been through some rough waters. Yet, at the end of their life, here they are, at the end of Sarah's life, still married and still very much in love. When Sarah passes away, Abraham's heart is broken. He's been with this woman for the better part of a century. At some point, it's, it's, it's how, do you, how do you even imagine life without this other person? They are still married. They are still in love. Abraham is brokenhearted over the death of his wife over the death of his princess. And I think, this is just a little sidebar, I think the key to a successful marriage is forgiveness. That's what I think the key. The number one key to a successful marriage is forgiveness. You have to be able to forgive one another. Amen. I believe Abraham and Sarah had learned to walk in forgiveness to one another. You know, Paul, the Apostle Paul, before he instructs the Ephesians on how to have proper order in their marriages, before he instructs them on that, he tells them this in Ephesians 4, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. You know, so many couples, they say, well, I can't, I can never forgive him. Look at what he did to me. I could never forgive her. Look at what she's done to me. The Apostle Paul says, if God has forgiven you, you can forgive others. And so I believe the key to a successful marriage is learning to walk in forgiveness. And the question we need to ask ourselves today, if we're married or if we're single and we're going to be married one day, statistics show that 91% of people will eventually become married or get married. You know, so much emphasis in our culture is put on the first day, right? The first day of marriage. So we have magazines, right? You know, bridal, whatever, exposés. Um, you know, every year, like, the Alamo Dome is taken over by people selling wedding stuff. And you can go and, like, taste wedding cake and try on wedding dresses and all this whole industry is around weddings and getting married and um, so much emphasis put on the first day reality tv shows about bridezillas some of you could have been on that show it's <laughs> probably true um, so much emphasis put on the first day but no matter what happens on the first day what really counts is the last day of your marriage. The most important day of your marriage is not the first day, it's the last day. Where will you be on the last day of your marriage? Will you be like Abraham and Sarah, still in love? Or will you be sitting across the table from a lawyer who's tearing that marriage apart? Where will, where will you be on the last day? We put so much emphasis on the first day. We need to think about the last day. I want to be like Abraham and Sarah, inseparable through the ups and the downs, learning to forgive each other, walking in repentance towards one another, walking in forgiveness with one another. If you are married, you will have difficult times in your marriage, period. End of story. Can I get a better amen? amen. But if you learn to forgive, you can overcome just about anything. Just about anything. Just like Abraham and Sarah, look to the rock from which you were cut out of. If their marriage can survive, so can yours. If you will walk in forgiveness by the power of God. Abraham's faith here again is on display. Abraham we know is the man of faith and he displays his faith in God and in his promise. God had promised that one day Abraham's descendants would own this land. It was an incredible promise 
It's, it, it's, it's a whole nation worth of land that God said he was going to give to a man and a woman in the twilight years of their life who had no children. But Abraham had believed God. Abraham had believed God's promise that one day his descendants would inherit this land. And now it's painfully obvious that that promise of God is not going to be fulfilled in his life or in Sarah's life. Sarah has now died. If God's going to keep his word, if God's going to fulfill this promise, Abraham's not going to see it, and certainly Sarah is not going to see it as a part of this life. She will not live to see the fulfillment of this part of God's promise. Now, she had seen the fulfillment of the baby boy, Isaac, laughter being born. But the promise was so much bigger than that. The promise was that the land would be inherited and that the nations of the world would be blessed through them. But here now, they're not going to see it together. And Abraham himself would have begun to realize that that part of God's promise wasn't going to be fulfilled in his life either. But notice that Abraham doesn't take Sarah back home where he came from to bury her. He doesn't take her back to the Ur of the Chaldeans. He doesn't take her back to Babylon where he came from. Abraham buries Sarah right in the middle of the land of promise. He purchases a plot of land in the midst of this promised land as an act of faith, believing one day my children will own all of this land my offspring, my descendants. The first land that any Hebrew owns in the promised land is a burial plot. The first land that any Hebrew owns of the promised land is a cemetery. And even though death has entered the picture, faith still is rising up within Abraham's heart. Even though his wife Sarah has died, and this passage is full of death. The word death or died in these short few verses is mentioned nine times. Nine times the word death or died has mentioned. Yet Abraham still has faith. Abraham is still trusting in God that God will keep his promise. And so Abraham... As an example to all of us who have loved ones who have passed away, Abraham buries his wife in faith. In faith he buries Sarah. But even though we have faith and even though Abraham had faith, burying a loved one is never easy, amen? Saying goodbye is never easy. And so we see that Abraham weeps, weeps over Sarah. It says when he realized he needed a place to bury her that he he got up from where he was and the picture is that he's there at Sarah's bedside just weeping, crying. Now Hebrews chapter 11 sheds some light upon what's happening in this passage. It sheds so much light on the life of Abraham and Sarah. And so if you would flip over to Hebrews chapter 11 for us for a few moments today. I'm going to start in verse 1, then I'm going to skip to verse 8. The writer of Hebrews says, Now faith, everybody say faith. Faith Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Or could, or could read, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. The assurance of things hoped for that Abraham, as he buries Sarah, he does so in faith, sure of the promises of God. Even, even though he doesn't see it with his eyes, It's as if it's already happened in his heart. It's as if there's evidence within his heart, within his spirit man, that he knows that one day God's word is going to come true. That's what faith is. 
Faith is having this, this settled assurance, this settled evidence inside that says, I trust in the word of God even though I don't see it with my natural eyes. Remember, I defined faith for you as holding on to the promises of God until you see them with your eyes, until they become a reality for you. Holding on to the promise. Abraham is holding on to the promise. Sarah was holding on to the promise. The substance of things hoped for. The conviction of things not seen. Verse 3 says, By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was made out of things that are not seen. That the, the material world came from the spiritual world. There's, there's another reality. There's a spirit world. There is a spirit dimension. Do you know this? And what we have today is the material world, and the material world is fading away, is passing away because of sin. Because sin entered the world, death has come into the world. Sarah died because sin entered the world. Sarah died because the material world is fading away, is passing away. There, is a, there are things happening in the spirit and there are things happening in the natural world. And so often we're so preoccupied with the natural world. What are we going to eat? Where are we going to eat? How much are we going to eat? Is it going to be good food that we eat? How am I going to pay my bills? And all of these things matter. Don't get me wrong. They, they matter. But there's so much more going on. And we as Christians who have been, had our eyes open to the fact that there is a spiritual world, we've been born again into the kingdom of God. We need to keep our eyes on the spirit realm. This is where faith lives. Faith lives in the spirit realm. If, if my faith was based on what I could, my five senses, what I could see, taste, touch, feel, or hear, you know how big my faith would be? It would be microscopic. But my faith is the evidence of things not seen. My faith is, is it exists in the spiritual realm. It exists in the kingdom of God. And so the, the writer continues, verse 8, By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance, he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. He's saying he was a sojourner. He didn't have a place to call his own. We who are part of the kingdom of God today, we are those same sojourners. We live in a land, in a world. This place is not our home. The kingdom of God is our home. The kingdom of God is where we're going. And we cannot allow our heartstrings to be so attached to this world, to the things of this life. This was easier for, for, for Christians to understand who lived in, in more difficult times than we live in. We live in the most prosperous nation under the most prosperous uh, uh, economy that the world has ever known. And it, what it does is it attaches our hearts to this world. We take up residence in this world, but then this world is taking up residence in our hearts. We need to be very careful that we still see ourselves as strangers, as sojourners, as ambassadors of the kingdom of God here on the earth today. By faith, he went to live in a land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has its foundations, whose designer and builder is God. Abraham, yes, he was stepping out on the promise that God would provide them that land naturally. But beyond that, he was looking for the kingdom of God. 
He was looking forward to living in the kingdom of God, the city whose designer and maker is God himself. That's what Abraham was looking forward to as he buried his wife, Sarah, through the ups and the downs. He's, he's looking for it. He has his eye on the kingdom, not the fleeting pleasures of this life, not this world that is passing away. And what the writer of Hebrews is going to argue is we should live that kind of life of faith, looking forward to not what we can get out of this life, but what the kingdom of God will be like looking and waiting and hoping and longing for the day where our faith will become sight because we have that assurance in our heart that it will. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive even when she was past the age since she, was, she considered him faithful, that is God, who had promised. Therefore, from one man and, his, and him as good as dead were born descendants as many of the stars of the heaven, as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. Verse 13, this is what I wanted to get to today. These all died in faith. These all died in faith. How did Sarah die? She died in faith. Next week, we're going to see Abraham die. How does he die? He dies in faith. How do you die in faith? I want to die in faith. Do you want to die in faith? Yes. Amen. You want to die believing in the promises of God? I do. Well, how do you do that? Well, it tells us in the next verse. To die in faith, you have to die not having received the things promised. How many of you still want to die in faith? Oh, no, not me anymore. That's what it means to die in faith. That the promises of God have, have still not become a complete and total reality for me. Now, the kingdom of God is, is here today. The kingdom of God, Jesus came and brought it. It's here today in a spiritual sense. And so we pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we love it when the kingdom of God breaks forth into this physical world, when we see people healed, when we see people delivered. Amen. But the, the, the totality and the fulfillment of the kingdom of God will be when Jesus returns. We have a taste of the kingdom today, but we will have its full and complete measure when Christ returns. Some of it now, praise the Lord for it. Most of it later, praise the Lord. Some of it now, most of it later. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar. They saw the promises of God. They said, I see you. I see the promise. I want the promise of God. I'm ready for the promises of God. They're desiring to be united with the promises of God. And look at what this mentality, look at what it produces in their life. It says, having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth, for people who speak thus or speak this way or who under, have this understanding, they make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had an opportunity to return. He's saying, Abraham didn't go back and bury Sarah where he came from. They weren't going back to where they came from. They were looking for the kingdom of God. You can't go back to the world once you've been born again. You can't go back to Egypt once you've been set free. We, we have to look forward to the promises of God when our faith will become sight for the return of Jesus Christ. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. Listen, dear Christian, this world is not your home. San Antonio, Texas is not your home. The kingdom of God is your home. The kingdom of God is where we are going. There is a city whose foundations have been laid by God himself. 
And that city is a city, that kingdom of God, it cannot be shaken. There's no economic collapse in the kingdom of God. There's no great depression in the kingdom of God. There's righteousness, peace, and joy in the kingdom of God. This is our hope. This is what we're looking for. This is what we are longing for. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 talks about that we have this inward longing, this groaning. As this world passes away, as our bodies themselves pass away, we long for the kingdom. We long for the kingdom. We hope for the kingdom of God. And we hold on to the promise until our faith becomes sight, until we see it with our own eyes. And for many of us, if not the majority of us, and if Christ doesn't return all of us, we will have to hold on to the promise of God through the doorway of death. We will have to hold on to the promises of God, even as we taste death. But the Apostle Paul, when he talks about Christians dying, you know the language he uses? Sleep. He says it's like they've fallen asleep. Because when Jesus returns, we're all going to have a party. He's going to wake us up. That's the alarm clock of heaven going to go off. And none of us are going to sleep through it. Amen. If, if you do have 1 Corinthians 15, I want you to flip over to it really quickly. 1 Corinthians 15, 19, the Apostle Paul says, If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people to be most pitied. He says, if Christ is only for this life, if, if you're only in it for, for what Jesus can do for you in this life, you've missed everything. Our hope is not in this life, it's in eternity, it's in the kingdom of God. He's saying, because of Christ, we're being persecuted. Because of Christ, we're being put to death in this life. But if we suffer for him, we will also be glorified with him. He says, get your eyes off of the, the struggles of this life. Put them on the hope that we have in the kingdom of God and in eternity. Verse 22, for as in Adam all die. That's the bad news. We've all been born into sin. We've all willfully sinned. We're sinners by nature and by choice. Because of that, we're under a curse. And if Jesus doesn't return in the next hundred years because we're descendants of Adam, we will all die. That's the bad news. But, but, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. I am so glad that I am not only a descendant of Adam, but I am a descendant of Jesus Christ. I am not only in Adam, I am in Christ Jesus today. And so that is, death is not the end for me. Verse 49, just as if we have borne the image of the man of dust being Adam, so shall we bear the image of the man of heaven, that being Christ. Verse 50, I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable, that's the physical realm, inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet of God will sound, and we the dead will be raised imperishable, talking about the glorified bodies that we will have. No sickness, no disease, no uh, limitations, no disabilities. Raised glorified, just as Jesus was raised glorified. Raised imperishable. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable. This mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, the mortal puts on immortality. Then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. 
Through the cross of Jesus Christ, we have the forgiveness of sins. But through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, we have hope of eternal life. For those who trust in Jesus, death is not the end. It is a glorious new beginning. Death is simply a doorway to receive all of the promises in their fullness and completion for those who are in Christ. This is why the Apostle Paul can write, to live is Christ and to die is gain. To live is Christ and to die is gain. Because he knew that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. He was like Abraham and Isaac and Jacob who had seen the promises from afar off and had said, I want the promises of God in my life. I'm going to hold on to them till I pass through the doorway and they are a reality in my life. We do not have to be afraid of death. We don't have to be afraid of anything because Jesus Christ has defeated death itself. Hell itself, the grave itself has been defeated. Peter, when he preaches the first Christian sermon in Acts chapter 2, verse 24, he says Jesus was killed, but death could not hold him down. Couldn't hold him down. It tried its best, but it couldn't hold Jesus down. And let me tell you what, if you are in Christ, death will not be able to hold you down. There's nothing that can hold you down if you are in Christ. So I want to encourage you today. I want to strengthen your heart today. Get your eyes off of the material. Put it on the spiritual realm, the promises of God, the promises of the kingdom. Pray your kingdom come. Pray your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Pray the kingdom of God. Envelop your life here on earth today and look forward to the day when your faith will become sight and when you will see the promises of God with your own eyes. With your own eyes. Abraham is going to be buried in this tomb. Isaac, his son, his wife, Rebekah, are going to be buried in this tomb. Jacob, their, uh, Abraham's grandson, his wife, Leah, are all going to be buried in this tomb in Hebron. When we go to Israel next year, we're going to visit Hebron. We're going to visit this tomb, the tomb of the patriarchs. It's going to be really great. Their bones are still there today as a witness that they inherited that land. That God kept his word. 500 years later, two spies are going to go in to a little city called Hebron. Their names were Joshua and Caleb. And when they visited Hebron, they came back and they brought a report. We can do it. The bones of Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Rebekah, Jacob, Leah was there as a witness that God is going to keep his promise and his word. When you die in faith, you become a witness to future generations. You become a witness to future generations as you hold on to your faith as death approaches. And even in death, I believe that your faith can speak to those who come after you.